Okay, so without further ado, we do have a Best Presentation Award winner. So this year's winner is Gert Viemos for Rethinking Satellite Operations. So congratulations, excellent talk. I think we'll have a So congratulations. Okay, so we'll get started with the morning session. I'd like to bring Dan Smith up to introduce our keynote. Yes, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Therese Moreto Jorgensen from the National Science Foundation, uh, where she's the She's a program director in the geospace section of the Atmospheric and Geospace Sciences Division. That sounds all scientific and researchy. She explained this morning, because we know her as the, a CubeSat leader in the industry. Uh, at NASA, she's well recognized uh, for CubeSat work. Uh, National Science Foundation doesn't have a CubeSat department. They don't have a CubeSat or a, a flight division. So they're doing the CubeSats under this organization. Uh, but she is the program manager for their CubeSat program, and you know, she's well recognized. And she's going to talk about imagining the future and what, what CubeSats mean to, to that as we talk about space and valuable science and things we can get uh, through CubeSat programs. Her background uh, with degrees uh, from our house university in Denmark, a PhD in theoretical physics from the University of Oxford in the UK. 11 years as space physics research scientist at different places around the world, some and then a visit at Goddard. Uh, so very well you known in, in that industry and now in the CubeSat industry. So let me introduce Dr. Jorgensen. Thank you very much. And is the sound okay? You can hear me. Good morning. I am really pleased to be here today to talk to you and uh, tell you why I love CubeSats and maybe why you should too. Uh, I look forward to show you some of the amazing things we are doing with scientific CubeSat missions and also to discuss uh, the great potential I see for CubeSats helping to transform the way we do space missions in the future. I, I can't do that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Too many. <laughs> Let me start, though, by saying a little bit about where I come from, just in case you don't know. The National Science Foundation is a research funding agency of the United States government. We fund basic research um, and education in science and engineering uh, very broadly. Uh, typically, the, the grants that we give out uh, are for to single investigators or small teams working on very specific uh, limited term research projects. Uh, grants are typically three years, and every year we give out something like 10,000 of, of these grants. We have an annual budget of about seven uh, billion dollars. Uh, yes, please. And of course, I do not have to explain long to this audience that measurements from space uh, observations from space, measurements in space, are necessary to conduct research in, in many different fields. And certainly a lot of the research we fund at the National Science Foundation also relies on measurements from space, uh, whether it be astronomy, astrophysics, space physics, that is my own background, or uh, geosciences, Earth observation type uh, data. We, we use it and mostly we get that, or, uh, almost exclusively, we get that from uh, uh, missions flown by NASA, NOAA, or the, the DOD. But recently we have also made some small ventures into taking a more active role in trying to help provide some of the data that the scientists so badly need. And we do this very much in the spirit of exploring, as I put there, on traditional, creative, low-cost ways to provide these uh, space uh, measurements. And one of the 
Really exciting things we have been doing in this arena is the CubeSat program, which is the reason I'm here to talk to you today and what I will be talking about. Yes, please. First, I know we've been through it yesterday, but just to put everybody on the same sheet, what is a CubeSat? It was a standard for PICO satellites and nano satellites developed in 1999 by it came from the university community. It was developed by two professors at the Cal Poly and, and Stanford. And it really was, their motivation was they wanted to devise a way for universities to do a simple but safe way for universities to uh, do space missions. And therefore, uh, uh, actually even more than the standard itself, the size of the satellite or what goes in it and what kind of components you can put in there, even more important for, the, for this idea is that it is a container, the deployer system. The CubeSats are contained during launch, making it virtually risk-free for the rocket or the main payload to uh, take them uh, uh, as secondary payloads into space. So these are the two very important principles of the CubeSat idea, building to a standard and being contained during launch. And I think that's behind the whole, why this has become such a big success. Uh, so what our main interest at NSF in looking into CubeSat is because we need measurements from space. Uh, so, and we see CubeSats as a great tool to maybe help provide some of those. Um, we need measurements not just for the science we do, but I think measurements from space, observations from space are really crucial also to solving uh, some of the important uh, problems facing society. We want to solve climate change, we want to solve land use, resource management, we want to do pollution tracking, uh, disaster monitoring, think about the ash cloud and the data we needed that at that time, if we could have launched some CubeSats out there and measured it, we could have saved tons of money uh, and inconvenience for people. So there are lots of good reasons and, and typically NSF is involved because when society face problems like that, they turn to the scientists and say, help us figure this out. And for that, we need measurement from space, and we think one of the ways to get some of that is through CubeSats. At the same time, we do things in new ways. We do space in new ways. We spur innovation, creativity, both on the science side and on the engineering uh, and technology development side, and we see that happening in our program at a rapid, rapid pace. Uh, finally, for us, doing these, being this sort of small research grants operations that NSF is, by doing CubeSats, that actually is almost the only way that doing space missions uh, gets it into being achievable within our sort of standard grants program. But CubeSats does that, and so we thought we should definitely give that a try. And also importantly, NSF mostly serves the academic uh, uh, community. Universities are our main uh, grant recipients. So with doing CubeSats, we also help uh, enhance the university participation in doing, in doing space uh, activities. Yes, please. But equally important to NSF is that, that doing CubeSat projects, uh, we help train and educate the next generation of both space scientists, experimental space scientists, and engineers. We provide, these projects provide unique opportunities to do hands-on, end-to-end experiences on real life uh, important uh, missions. And that's invaluable for if we want to keep a, uh, a workforce for the future and actually also be a leading force in space in the future. So, yeah. so based on this very strong motivation, in 2008, we started a program to do CubeSat projects for scientific research. A focus right now is on atmospheric and uh, space science, because that's where I come from. That's the kind of science we do anyway. Uh, we have had four competitions so far with an overwhelming response. Once we put that idea out there to the uh, CubeSat and the, our science community, they really jumped on it. We have uh, seen more than 60 unique missions being proposed, uh, all representing excellent science ideas and also an excellent use of this new uh, technology that CubeSat provides both using it, pushing the limits, being creative. Um, so far we have been able to start 10 projects, and I will show you at least some of them. Um, and just to put the scope, these uh, grants 
that we award under the program are for a total of $900,000, and typically for a three-year uh, duration. But that is the total cost, just like somebody said yesterday. That's it, that for everything. It's the development, the build, the operations, the science, everything. Yes, please. And here is just a depiction of the 10 projects. Uh, the one on your left, the, these six are all in orbit, uh, providing valuable observations and data. The next four are also uh, scheduled for launch within the next uh, year or two. And unfortunately, I won't have time to go through, uh, through and, and tell you in detail about each of these projects. Uh, it's a shame, though, because there are lots of good stories and lots of exciting uh, science. Each of them represents a unique and compelling science investigation. That was how they were picked. So I can guarantee you that. They went through a rigorous process. They were picked for excellence. But they also represent a really a strong CubeSat technology capability. That was also why they were picked. We want to try something new, but we also want to at least try to make sure that it actually works. As altogether, they represent a really broad range of uh, both science focus, science topics in atmospheric science and space science, but also in measurement techniques. Everything from, I'll show you, advanced radar detectors, uh, energetic particle detectors, a gamma ray detector, uh, plasma instruments, uh, coming up to the later ones, uh, mass spectrometers, more advanced instruments, uh, images, uh, hyperspectral images. There's a little bit of everything. Yes, please. And I encourage you to pick up. Last year, we finally got together and put a report together. It's a, it says an annual report. That's just because it's the first one, but it does actually cover all the first years of the of the program. And I know because of the archaic uh, NSF web system, the link there is impossibly long. But if you Google NSF CubeSat report, it should come up as the first hit. So I encourage you to look there if you want more details on all these projects. Uh, before I go in and, and describe just some of the results and some of the missions we have done, I want to emphasize that we are not doing this alone, and I don't think we could. NSF is, uh, is not well equipped at all and also has a strongly declared uh, no interest in going into the launch business. Uh, so I cannot emphasize enough the importance of during these last five years, uh, NASA, NRO, the DOD, stepping up to the plate on this and providing uh, easily available and frequent launch opportunities. That has benefited uh, immensely, not just my program, but uh, the whole US uh, CubeSat community. Uh, and not only do they provide the launches, they actually also manage something which we heard a lot about, I did at least sitting in the back listening uh, to talks yesterday, big government, uh, and, and how everything gets bureaucratic and, and, and uh, unwieldy. But they managed actually to not only provide the launches, but also set up really good processes for handling all these CubeSats coming in, the integration, the documentation, the qualifications testing, uh, and simply management uh, of these projects through the launch uh, phase. Incredible, and I'm very, very grateful. We have had seven missions launched, nine satellites total, uh, <coughs> on these uh, five launches, and our four uh, other current projects that are underway are also all selected for launch with NRO and, and NASA. We also have a strong uh, uh, collaboration set up with uh, NASA Wallops uh, to provide technical mission support. And I want to stress that this uh, gives us access in this program, me and the teams, uh, to an immense uh, experience, knowledge base at uh, Wallops for doing missions and for all sorts of engineering. So they are uh, at our back to help out with any problems we encounter. It's on an as-needed basis, and I must stress, we have needed them much, much less than I thought we were going to. The teams are really, as I ex expected and hoped, they are self. Once we uh, provide the award, somebody said yesterday, if you want the innovation, you need to give them freedom, and that's very much our principle, too. Once we select for excellence, we give them the award, and then we pretty much leave them to it. It's up to them how they want to uh, carry their pr project through to success. We're not, not prescribing, uh, um, at least very minimally so, prescribing any uh, set review schedule or management structure as such. It's up to them how they, how they do it. Uh, yes, please. And now, finally, let's get to show you some of the missions. The first one we picked, 
selected and flew was the Radio Aurora Explorer, or RACS. And actually, it turned out to be not one, but two satellites, uh, because the first one was uh, built, launched in November 2010, and everything worked, but it suffered a premature uh, cease of operation due to uh, uh, solar panel uh, failures. So they got only a few months in, in space. Then they turned around, refurbished the engineering model, and a year later launched that one, which then completed a, 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 a fully successful uh, mission for them. It uh, was operational for nearly 18 months and has done all the science we, and more than we expected it to. And the way RACS works, and now if I, yes please, and the, the way RACS works, and now if I am to show you some science results, you'll have to forgive me for being just a little bit sciencey for a moment. But the way RACS works, and I'm just being, uh, being with communication and radio frequencies and all that, it should have some interest to you. The way RACS works, and I hope you can all see it, is that it uses a radar receiver on board the satellite together with a ground-based transmitter to conduct a bi-static uh, radar experiment. And the geometry of this experiment is, is, is in the sketch uh, that you see down here at the bottom. As the ground station, it uses a, um, uh, a, a very powerful advanced incoherent scatter radar. NSF runs a couple of, of those for, for, for ionospheric research. And what that gives them is it, it can be a, a well-controlled, very narrow, powerful beam that you can use to probe the ionosphere with. And because the structures, Rax's um, purpose is that it wants to look at ionospheric irregularities, but the kind of structures it, it is interested in are aligned along with the Earth's magnetic field. And so at high latitudes in the auroral region, if the structures are aligned with the uh, magnetic field and you probe it with a radar beam from ground, the, the optimal place to pick up the scattered signal that you can use to probe these irregularities with is in place. And that's the simple brilliance of the RACS experiment, is this setup and an optimal way of using a, a satellite to do something that otherwise we could not do. I learned something yesterday. I always thought of RACS as a smart satellite, but I learned yesterday that RACS is not smart, it's fat. Whatever. <laughs> when, when, when it does an experiment, RACS flying over the radar, picking up the, the the radar beam or the, and the backscatter from whatever irregularities uh, the beam has encountered, it processes the data on board into these so-called uh, range, time, intensity plots. That's done on board the satellite. And then we can look at them on ground and identify whether the uh, appropriate backscatter was uh, detected on, in any given experiment before they start the arduous process of downloading the raw data for the scientists because then you can zero in. The, the, this diagram here shows you about one minute of data in, in this uh, range, time, intensity plot, and the back that I'm interested in is the one where the black line goes through. The strong signal below, that's the direct beam from the radar, and then the back scatter from up higher in the atmosphere is, is, is the little plot you see there. there. Then when that is identified, the scientist asks uh, the students at Michigan, please, can we have the, the data down? And they work for it months and months. It can be up to, I think, tens of megabytes uh, in such an experiment to get it down. And then they can do some further analysis. And then they create one of the results, an example of a result is the kind of plot they, they do there. It, now they have translated the same little plot of, of backscatter <coughs> intensity uh, echoes, as uh, they call them, uh, and have calculated for instance, uh, now it's shown as a, as a function of altitude in the atmosphere, so they can tell us where in the atmosphere were these irregularities occurring. And the yellow lines now tells us how strongly aligned with the magnetic field, how perfectly aligned with the magnetic field were they. And this little diagram shows the two major findings of the RACS mission for this particular uh, experiment, that they, these kind of, of the plasma instabilities are much more strongly confined to a certain latitude in the ionosphere, around 110 kilometers, and much more perfectly aligned. The zero line goes through there. It's one degree on either side, so aligned with the magnetic field to within a, a fraction of a degree, and that was uh, much uh, very different from what current theories predicted. 
And um, the reason this is important is because we need this kind of information to get good physical models of how energy is dissipated through these kind of plasma instabilities in, in the ionosphere. And if you are an ionospheric scientist, I can guarantee you this is really exciting. <laughs> the point here is we're doing real science with these uh, missions. The other mission I want to show, uh, quickly show you is the Colorado Student Space Weather Explorer. Uh, as the name says, it's built at University of Colorado. It's another 3U CubeSat, and it carries an um, energetic uh, particle detector also built at the university. Uh, the purpose of, of this one is that it wants to look at the energy distribution of the energetic particles observed in low Earth orbit, both from the sort of low latitude extension of the Earth's radiation belts, but also from energetic protons that can sometimes get dumped close into the atmosphere uh, during solar eruption events. And it was launched in 2012, has already completed a full mission success, um, and is still at least partly in operation now, 17 months uh, later. And I show you here a result from, uh, from CESWI. This is now a geomagnetic storm in October of last year. And the diagram shows 12 days of data. And the way we know there's a geomagnetic storm going on is this bottom graph. It's the so-called storm index derived from ground-based magnetometer measurements. And the storm happens there when this makes a, a drastic dip, and then it slowly recovers. That's the geomagnetic storm. It's the signature of a geomagnetic storm. The SESWI spacecraft me measures uh, protons and electrons in three different energy channels. What I show here is a diagram on top, is the lowest energy proton uh, measurement, and the next one is the lowest energy electron measurement. That there are gaps in the data now through these uh, 12 days is because at this point in the mission, they have to duty cycle the instrument. Uh, that's just because of power degradation uh, in the solar cells. But they still get, even at this stage, very exciting data. The data is, is uh, plotted as a function of something called L value. It translates roughly into uh, latitude. So a low value means closer to the equator, a high value means closer to the pole. And what we see is that before the storm starts, we see up here the big red splotch on the, in the protons, a, high, a, a strong influx of energetic protons at high latitudes. They come from the sun. It's, it's a result of the solar eruptions that burst out these high energy protons, and they get along. They get into the uh, near Earth environment along the Earth magnetic field, so therefore close to the poles. We also see the yellow one that get, goes deeper in, that during the next day or so, they actually get trapped inside the Earth's radiation belt. Only for a day or so, then they're dumped into the atmosphere and disappears out of the radiation belt. And these are unique data. We have not measured this before. And that's amazing that it takes a CubeSat to go up there and give us this kind of, uh, of, um, of results. Yes, please. So both RAX and SESWIN use the traditional setup for communications of, for CubeSats. It used the 9,600 board, uh, <coughs> a popular CubeSat radio, with fairly simple antennas uh, operated at the universities by the students and working in the amateur uh, band. And uh, the, the graph here shows the, the top one is the cumulative data downloaded for the RACS mission throughout 15 months of their, of their mission. So it's the daily rate. There's two, two lines. The, the top one is what they downloaded at Michigan at their main station. And the other line is what was contributed from uh, some ham operators spread around the world. And that's, of course, the advantage of working in the amateur arena is you do get the help from everybody who, who, who wants to out there. Uh, a total throughout the mission of about 160 megabytes of data. And for CES, we used a similar set of very similar numbers, 140 megabytes of data total for for 15 uh, months of their mission. And so the point I want to make here is that, am I, uh, I mean, quantity isn't always everything. <laughs> yes, it's nice to have lots of data, but sometimes it's more important that you measure the right thing and that you have good quality uh, measurements. These missions did real science uh, research 
with this, with this very li uh, low data amount. But of, of course, it is exciting also to get more data, and that's what I want to illustrate with this third mission uh, example I want to show you. It's called the DICE mission. It was also an early one. We picked it's our first two satellite missions. It consists of two identical one and a half U CubeSats. It has uh, uh, instruments on board to measure the plasma density, the magnetic field, and the electric field. It wants to look, at, look again at ionospheric uh, density structures during geomagnetic storms. It needed two satellites because it's wanted to separate out the temporal and spatial uh, variations in these structures. It was launched in October 2011. Unfortunately for this one, we cannot declare full mission success on the science side because the electric field uh, booms were never deployed. So they did get important uh, density and magnetic field data, but not electric field data. It was, however, a huge technology success because they demonstrated uh, an unprecedented uh, capability in, uh, in downlink um, data rates for, for CubeSats, uh, uh, up to three megabytes per second uh, uh, downlink capability. It was operational also for uh, more than uh, 18 months. And uh, right from the, as a design, the uh, operations plan, the, the data taking plan for DICE was very ambitious. They wanted 35 hertz data from all of these three instruments on a continual basis. They thought that's what they needed to truly do the science they wanted to do. That corresponds, that amounts to about one gigabyte of data for each satellite every day. So you can see with that traditional setup I just showed you for RAGS and SESWA, well, there's no way this could be done, so they needed to work out a, a more capable solution. They worked with uh, the L3 communications uh, system to develop the Cadet U uh, radio as a new CubeSat radio. It works in a government band, 460 to 470 megahertz, uh, reserved for meteorological satellite uh, uh, operations. And because of, of, um, of power constraints, not just on the CubeSat actually, but also through regulations for usage, usage in this band, uh, they need a big dish to, to close the link and, and get those uh, data rates. And for this purpose, the, through this collaboration with Wallops, we refer, they refurbished the, uh, one of their old big uh, UHF radar dishes at Wallops to use as a CubeSat uh, ground station for, for this project. And we see the data download rates are now very, very different. Uh, these diagrams show the daily recovered uh, data from each of the satellites. And uh, it's a logarithmic scale on the left, so I marked the 10 megabyte and the 100 megabyte points. And we see that in just a few days, one of these satellites get down as much data as the traditional uh, missions get in, in the whole mission lifetime of a year or more. So that's a big uh, success. And, and with, the, with the experience from this and all the additional development work that is still ongoing on this system, I think we can safely promise uh, potentially uh, even better results in the future. So then these are just a few examples. And uh, I, there's so many more stories to, to tell from the other missions. What this program has done is it has uh, shown that CubeSats can have scientific value. We see that already. We have implemented very creative uh, scientific missions and carried them out uh, successfully. We have uh, several of the, of the several of these uh, missions have now provided first of their kind, not just good uh, measurements, but first of their kind measurements, and been the basis for scientific publications. <coughs> There's lots more to come. The data is still being collected. It, it's been shared with the science community to use together with all sorts of other uh, science and investigation and comparing to models. There's a lot of science still in, in these data. Uh, the projects have also clearly had big educational impact. Each, each of these uh, missions has involved more than 20 students, many of them many more, 40, 60, in, in various setups, either as classwork, as clubs, as paid student labor, many different <coughs> ways. And what I hear back from, these, uh, uh, from the teams is that as a student, having worked on one of these projects, especially having worked on a on a satellite project that gets to fly in space and is an, an uh, operational success is a real boost to the future career of these students. We are, we are helping them along, and I think helping the whole industry along uh, with them. I also 
think it's fair to say that with this program, we have helped increase the recognition of CubeSats as a viable option, a, a viable option that should be taken uh, seriously for doing uh, space missions. Uh, looking just a little bit to the future, just for my particular program, there's uh, simply so much more we would like to do. I mean, I have another 50 missions being proposed that I never did. We have a new competition this summer. I'm sure there's going to be even more excellent ideas, and I can only pick a few. Also, we really do, I do see a big potential also within, we're right now in atmospheric science and space science. I see a big potential also in the Earth observation realm of doing other kinds of sciences. We want to expand into that. That's in the works. Uh, one of the big uh, um, advantages of CubeSats is that you can do many of them. You can have them work together in constellations. And uh, I right now, have, it's a challenge, at least in my program, within the scope we have to realize uh, those kind of ideas. Um, I mean, we are participating with four CubeSats into, in the European-led QP50 project. And that may be one way. We're looking to that. At, uh, see how this works out. Maybe that's one way to realize constellations is to work together in this really wide-based way where everybody just contributes a little bit, but together we have a constellation mission. That's certainly an, a thought that, that we like a lot if we could, uh, but, but it takes a lot of community uh, coordination and, uh, to do that. Of course, the prospects of getting measurements, not just from low Earth orbit where all our missions are currently, but everywhere where we need data or where we need constellations. It's, of course, really exciting to also think that CubeSats can do that, and I think they will. Uh, right now, there's some technical challenges in doing that, uh, communications being one of them, robustness maybe, radiation hardening. Uh, but I know there's also s uh, groups working on that, and I think we will see results from that uh, coming very soon. And then the, we still need one of the challenges is we still need a good, we don't have a good way right now on how to handle the frequency allocation, licensing, uh, answering concerns to the rest of the, of the satellite world about whether we are just adding to space debris problems. So those are also some of the issues we, we need to work, work with. But I wanted, in, 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 before closing, I, I wanted to say just a little bit more about why the potential for using CubeSats is so great. And in a more general sense, beyond my own program and potentially even beyond doing science missions. And when you consider whether a CubeSat would be a viable option for you to look into for your particular uh, space mission needs, it's very easy to get stuck on the limitations. It's very easy to say, oh yeah, and of course, if you need to fly a six meter meter like on the James Webb telescope, or you need a 40 meter rigid boom to, to carry out your, your measurements, then yes, maybe at least right now, there's no way to do that on a CubeSat. Uh, there are also obvious, uh, we, we just talked about some of those ob obvious limitations in the data rate down link, the, the power uh, in pointing, stability, maneuverability, uh, they don't have proportion, at least not yet. And if you're, go, if you're being launched as a secondary payload, you maybe have only a limited choice uh, of orbits. You, you do not have full control. These are all the obvious limitations, and that's fine. It's so easy to get stuck on them. But what is important to realize is that there are also some distinct advantages you get from the CubeSat or small missions in general. The large missions, because they're large, we can only do a few of them. They're big, they're expensive. We can typically only do a few. We're never going to do constellations with big missions. I don't believe so. Um, because we do few, we tend to make them very comprehensive. They have to do the perfect job because we can only do it so seldom. So we collect all the kind of measurements, all the instruments we can think of to answer any, uh, a given problem need to be on there because we won't get a chance anytime soon to do it again, which makes the missions very complex which makes them take them a long time to put together, which makes them, again, big, long time, makes them expensive, make them risk adverse, because we do it so seldom, we cannot risk failure. Small missions or cube sets, on the other hand, offer that you can do many of them. Multipoint uh, observations are within reach. You can allow yourself to be narrowly focused. That's what almost all of the uh, of our science CubeSat missions show the power of allowing focus. 
saying, I want to take just a simple measurement where my fat is doing really well, and I don't have to pay any consideration to any other experiments on board my satellite. There's no interference, there's no other instrument PI telling me my instrument can't do this or I can't do that. You are in charge and you can, you can uh, allow yourself to be. They have fast turnaround. Uh, it's not decades from a science idea to we try it out in practice. It's maybe a year or two. That's a very powerful concept. And you can try out new experimental approaches. You do not have to first prove that it works before you can actually get to do it. And in some ways, uh, there's a, uh, a powerful concept of CubeSat is that you can view them as defensible and replenishable. That's not only a good way to, to, to do a different approach to uh, risk mitigation or, 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 or ma risk management is that, yeah, so what some of them don't work, but you can send up another one. That's what happened with Rex too. Uh, but they're also dispensable so that you can actually maybe fly them places where otherwise you wouldn't risk sending your satellites. So I see many, many ways that CubeSat can contribute, almost no matter what your mission is. And I listed just a few of them here. Even if you do fly to do the, the big science, the big science questions, or your big mission objectives, whatever it is, you fly, fly the big comprehensive missions. Because there are few, they cannot be everywhere all the time. CubeSats can help fill in gaps, both in local, in, in, in coverage, spatial or temporal. Um, and as I said before, they are perfect if you want to do multi-point measurements of many, many sorts, either in swarms. You can do dense swarms to look at regional features or small scale structures or whatever it is you're looking at. Or you can fly them in big extended networks to get global perspective of things very powerful both in science and in surveillance and everything. And with constellations, you can also start exploring new measurement techniques for space, <coughs> doing tomography or interferometry, something we only see in MRI scanners, but why not doing it in space to get 3D perspective of things. And again, we can do technology experiments and we can probe new regions because they're dispensable. It's a very powerful concept for going into the lower uh, the lower altitude of the, of, of the upper atmosphere. We have very few measurements from, say, the region between 100 kilometers and 300 kilometers. It's very obvious we could, we could pop out a lot of CubeSats from the space station, keep measuring, keep measuring. Yes, they only last three months, but we keep supplying them and they keep burning up. Why not? And I know that's a very powerful idea and it's being pursued, and I think very soon we're going to do something like that. So I want to leave you with just one a uh, final thought, and that is the real power, the, the potential for CubeSats to transform the way we think about taking space measurements and doing space missions uh, is that it encourages a change of mindset in how we think about these things. So if you adopt the two principles of CubeSats, which is building to the standard, building to the CubeSat standard, and containerizing your launch, then you get to work inside the new paradigm that is characterized by low cost, high risk acceptance, and very broad participation. Really, the big influx of ideas and innovation, you open yourself up to that. But the, the back side of the coin is you have to embrace that to get the full benefit of CubeSat missions. If you do not want to work in, uh, inside the new paradigm, CubeSats are not going to be, be the big uh, change or re reformer that you want it to be. So with this, I just invite you all to join the CubeSat uh, revolution. And if there are any tricky questions, you'll have to wait and ask uh, Professor Cutler to join the panel. <laughs> Rick Donnelly from Aerospace. Um, so th the stories we've heard yesterday as well as yours have convinced me of one seems to be inalterable fact, which is ground has now become the, the constraining factor for the science and the other missions we want to do. We've worked today on the kindness of strangers, you know, whether it's other people to make sure that the data came down or very, using very low data rate things. If you, if you think about the future, it feels like you're going to have to confront the notion that somehow 
to your point, you're going to have to build a consortium of NSF and NASA and others to build the, the ground infrastructure you need to grow. Otherwise, you're going to be trapped with you know, no way of getting it down because you can't just stand up hundreds and hundreds and expect Wallops Island to handle them all or L3. I think that's true. I, and I think we're getting closer to a point where we can start that conversation and start doing that. I'm looking over to the CubeSat community to take this on themselves, just like they themselves developed the whole CubeSat idea. But I'm certainly ready to do my part to help, uh, just like we have uh, so far. We, we have been very reluctant because of the way, the, the, when we started the program five years ago, and I still am not quite there to say we are ready to know what the, what the solution should look like and what the solution should be, and, and then go out and try to implement it. I, I don't think we know well enough what would be a good solution. But, but you're right, it's, it's, it's the next thing to do. Thank you. CubeSats could be useful for um, kinds of uh, uh, um, uses where there would still need to be uh, security or, you know, jamming. I mean, it looks like you're basically using it just for science where you don't mind if everybody gets the data. Um, are there any kinds of things you see where the, the data would have to be secured or? I, I not all of our missions are freely and openly downloading data. Uh, I mean, like the DICE mission I just showed, it only downloads data over the very in a very controlled way, on, only at the Wallops uh, station. Uh, so I don't think that's a principal uh, restriction, no. It's just the way it was done when it was operating in that amateur arena where they all help each other. And there's some, some uh, powerful aspects of that. I mean, <laughs> that can be good, but it doesn't have to be. No, I don't think that is a big limitation. So do you think that there are ways to protect them, or do they need to be protected, or do you think there's safety in numbers? I don't think it's easier. I, I'm not an expert, but I wouldn't think it's easier to, to hijack a CubeSat than any other satellite. I, I don't think so. No. I mean, whether you would want to, for those kind of purposes, work in this paradigm, that's a different question. I, I, I don't know. For science, it's perfect. That's all I can say. So you've shown how the universities have really led this effort with mm -hmm. help from NSF. But now NASA and the others are starting to say, where's trying to define their own niche and whether there really is the concept of mm -hmm. university class CubeSats versus big government NASA type CubeSats. Is there really that distinction anymore? I don't think there has to be. I, I think the, the thing to, if you want the, as I said, it comes back to this, if you want the full benefit of CubeSats, you need to do them in this way. You, need, you cannot, I mean, you won't get the full benefit of CubeSats if you do CubeSats as if they were just miniature versions of your big satellite. And, and that goes to everything. It goes to the way how you manage your programs and how you manage your projects, how you manage the processes uh, through the whole uh, uh, mission lifetime. You need to rethink and learn from the, from the university community on this, I think. So, but if you're open to that, I don't see why, why it couldn't benefit all sorts of purposes and also some of the, the NASA uh, objectives. I mean, they are science objectives too, so I think a lot of, I mean, we're, we're, we're after the same kind of science, so I don't see why it wouldn't work and why we couldn't work together even more on that uh, and use the benefit that comes from both sides. That it happens a lot just by sort of, uh, uh, sheer chance that uh, many of our uh, CubeSats actually work, uh, are collaborations between universities and some government uh, uh, centers on that. Um, and I think that could be expanded.